we've come to delineate certain portions of the body, fingers, toes, organs, joints, tissues, cells, as separate objects. However, the body is actually one indivisible thing, isn't it? There's just a single body. The body doesn't have separate parts. It's an entire whole. For example, take the part of the body that we designate as the wrist. Where does that portion end and the rest of what we conventionally label the arm begin? And where does the arm end and what we refer to as the shoulder begin? We of course understand that these designated parts are connected to the entirety of the body. However, our tendency is to conceive of them as having their own individual integrity and autonomous existence, as if they were somehow separable from the whole. Now, just as we do with the body, the physical body, and its seemingly separate parts, we divide the field of experience, what we might call the body of experience, into seemingly separate things. So just as I continue to read, just to feel the body of your experience right now, which is the full field of experience, all the different dimensions of it, right? Which is all you're ever feeling anyway. <laughs> this is all that's ever occurring, is a kind of engagement with the field of experience, okay? We call the separate parts of experience by many names, thoughts, memories, perceptions, feelings, sensations, and so on. However, these designated parts are not actually divisible from the entire body of experiencing itself. Conventionally, we of course make such distinctions, identifying the different portions of the body of experience as separate experiential phenomena. And yet we can't actually tell where the seemingly separate parts of experiencing end and the whole of the experiential field begins. So for example, you could think a thought right now, like, I don't know what you're gonna have for lunch or dinner. You know, just have that thought, that thought is there as, as a, as you could say, a seemingly separate piece and we explored this last week when we were talking about boundaries, but it's very much the same thing. Can you actually find a way in which what you're calling thought is in fact separate from the entire field of experience? It's very paradoxical. You can identify and distinguish these seeming different pieces, much as you can identify the different waves in the sea. There's that wave and there's that wave. There's thought, there's feeling, there's sensation but you can't actually pull them out of the whole field. They're inseparable from the field. And this is extraordinary to start to appreciate the seamless nature of the body of experience. We make these distinctions, identifying the different portions of the body of experience as separate phenomena, and yet, we can't actually tell where the seemingly separate parts of experiencing end and the whole of the experiential field begins. Like the ocean and its ever-changing waves, the parts and the whole are ultimately inseparable. Now let's return to the question of identity. The sense of who and what we are, when we say, I'm going to the store, or I'm on a Zoom call, the sense of who and what we are is in many respects a function of what parts of the body of experiencing we're focusing on, and in turn deeming as more or less significant. For example, there may be a focus on certain thoughts, emotional states or personality characteristics and a corresponding sense of identification with those. In other words, we imagine that's what we are. 
At other times, the focus may shift towards some other aspect or dimension of the body of experiencing, such as our physical existence, our gender, our race, our political affiliation, or maybe our favorite sports team. And when this attentional shift in emphasis occurs, a different sense of identity or self-sense becomes more predominant. All of which raises a very provocative question. Exactly what part or parts of the full body of experiencing are we? Are we these physical bodies? Are we the myriad thoughts streaming, coursing through what we call the mind? Or maybe we're the ever-changing cascade of energetic qualities and emotions being experienced. And what about all that we're seeing, hearing, touching, and tasting? Are we not also those parts of the body of experiencing? Why reduce or limit ourselves to just one part or parts? Wouldn't that be tantamount to looking at a finger or a toe, a kidney or the brain, and imagining those somehow represent the whole of the body? Isn't it somewhat arbitrary to claim we are only certain portions of the body of experiencing and not others? Feel that little flicker of energy in your stomach? Isn't that also what you are? See the clouds floating in the spacious blue of space, maybe that's you too. Hear the sounds of crickets at night, feel that rush of love, the discomfort of uncertainty, the warmth of social connection. Maybe it's all you. So just as we sit here for just a few moments together, just feeling eyes open or closed, it doesn't matter. Just experiencing whatever you're experiencing, watching, of course, the way attention floats around the field of experience, doesn't it? There's this memory, there's this fantasy, there's this body sensation, there's this visual image. There's just little sparkle of indefinable energy and tingling. There's sounds. What if what you were, what if what you are is everything that's being experienced, the whole? It's not you in a world that's being experienced. It's you are the entire world of experiencing. In other words, there's just wholeness. There's not a subject experiencing objects. We could say it's all subjects, it's all subjective, or it's all objective, it doesn't really matter. But those two poles, just feel the way in which those poles don't really, can't really find them. It's not so much a self in relationship to all of this other stuff we call not self. There's just you or just the world. Same thing, one thing. One ocean of experience with many, many different aspects to it for sure. Thoughts are distinct, aren't they, from feelings and sensations and a memory has a different sense than a fantasy of the future and sound has a different quality than sight than vision 
So there's all this distinction, all this differentiation in the field, but it's one field. And what we are is just experience. All of this experience, all of it. And from this perspective, things aren't happening to us. What we are is simply the happening. All of the happening, all of the event, all of the apparition that we call life, all this, the magic show, the inexplicable miraculous stuff of life. We are yet another of the appearances of life, but there's just this singular life. And whatever we imagine ourselves to be can't be found to be separate from, from anything. You can't find any separation. And this, this perspective of one thing, one field, has no edge to it. It's an edgeless field. It doesn't, not, it may seem like sort of a bubble of your experience, right? But the bubble has no clear edge to it. So it's boundless, infinite. This cuts through this particular perspective cuts through all these conventional notions that we have. One that's coming to mind right now is the idea of cause and effect. One thing, a cause having an effect on some other thing, right? That's a perspective, it's a valid perspective and we operate generally from that vantage that we live in a world of cause and effect. This happens and then something else happens as a result of the happening of this. But, but that suggests there's two things, doesn't it? But from the perspective I'm talking about, there aren't two things. <laughs> there's one thing. The cause is the effect. <laughs> They're one thing. <laughs> one ocean moving. So in, in, in this also cuts through very, very, you know, consensus sort of reality uh, idea that we're, um, you know, we're subject to the events that are occurring, you know, subject to the subject, the one who the events are occurring to and having an effect on, like they're causing something to happen to us. That's all based on, on, um, the notion that there are two things. Let's see if you can find two things. Or do you just find experiencing? And, and, and I think the recognition of this can be as simple as simply feeling what's here. Feel what's here. That's what's actual is the felt sense of what's here. And there's not two things. There's just the feeling of what's here. Lots of different ways that can be described, of course, but. You know, you, you touch some object, like wherever you're sitting, you know, if you touch, conventionally thinking I'm sitting on a chair, so I'm I, 
am going to touch the chair. The subject I is going to touch the object chair, right? But as experience, all there is is feeling <laughs> of the experience that I call touching a chair, me touching a chair. But as a feeling, it's absolutely singular, isn't it? There's not a subject and an object. There's just experience. It's a very, very different. <laughs> the feeling of that is very, very different. It's um, there's not one thing pushing against another, not one thing arguing with another, not one thing in opposition to another. What if there was nothing in opposition to anything else, actually? That's what reality is like. It's, there's not one thing opposed to one, another thing. There's one thing. And that has a very different set of felt sense. The sense of that feels different. And um, yeah, the implications of that are I mean, sometimes the, the no ordinary way of defining things as events happening to me is going okay. And when the events are relatively pain-free and to our liking and all is well, but what about when the shit's hitting the fan and things are difficult? I was talking before we formally started about my, my dad and the challenges he's facing with his health right now. And he very much you know, has a sense understandably of that, of how, overwhelming that conventional understanding of events happening to us can be what the experience of that can feel like. It can feel like hell. It can feel like, and, and it does not infrequently for humans, feel like we're at the mercy of the events of our lives, the circumstances, the experiences. And then we try to do something about that. Again, understandable. We try to rectify the circumstances and the experiences so that we have more of a sense of well-being perfectly fine thing to do. I do it all the time. So in the case of my father, to use that example, he, he can try to, and through the support of people in his life, including his medical practitioners who are trying to help rectify this event um, that he's trying to contend with, to heal it, to fix it, to repair it, and so on, so that his quality of life can return because from within the, the ordinary sort of defined framework of cause and effect and separate objects and subjects and self and other and all of that, it, it, the quality of life is very low for him to the point of where he's not sure it makes sense, you know, to be alive. It's that low, right? Very understandable. But that's not the only perspective. There's this other perspective that transcends those definitions of separate pieces and things and cause and effect. And it doesn't negate that perspective. It just illuminates another perspective that we can um, avail ourselves of, that we can feel, recognize, and um, discover a um, you could say another world, but it's this world. It's not another world. It's this world. It's not two worlds. The defined world of seemingly separate pieces and parts is the same as the ultimately indefinable, transcendental, singular world beyond all the definitions that make it appear as if there are separate pieces and parts. Two worlds, they coexist in every instant, and they are ultimately a single reality. The described world and the ultimately unresolvable, indescribable, indeterminate, transcendental world of which the seemingly de describable world is made of. That's what's really trippy is that all of the descriptions are attempts to characterize and reify and make substantive something that is ultimately um, 
not reifiable. It's, it's beyond any possibility of classifying or characterizing or defining or describing. And therein lies the great freedom. It's the freedom from all descriptions, all designations, all characterizations, all and all the apparent limitations that spring forth from those descriptions and definitions. I like to say, I'm going to end by saying this, that, you know, we can solve the apparent problems of the world at two levels. One is to address them at the level of the description, like with my father's case, addresses cancer surgically, addresses pain with pain medication, um, and so on and so forth, right? So that's addressing the problem at the level of the, the description. Very reasonable. And we can also address problems by realizing that they don't exist. that they are in a sense defined into existence. So those may seem very contradictory somehow, but, but they both, again, they coexist. If one, you know, if I hit my head really hard on the table that I'm sitting next to, you know, I'll, I'll feel what we describe as pain. And then I might need to do something about that, you know, put ice on the bump that I just made by hitting my head on the table. So that's all the described world. And yet each one of those things, the table, the head that hit the table, the ice that I put on the head, every single one of those parts of that story that I'm describing, that description that I'm relaying is ultimately unresolvable and indescribable, infinite, fathomless. It's just like, um, I think we can understand them the simultaneity of these perspectives by you know, looking at one of these things at a physical level, like I talk about this sometimes, you know, there's the table and yeah, the simultaneity it is from one perspective, the thing's hard, it's, it's got substance, right? And then from the perspective of what it is more fundamentally in terms of its quantum subatomic nature, it's anything but a table, <laughs> right? It's a dance of inconceivable God knows what, you know, I mean, it's, it's not just extraordinary, like those, it's not two things, it's not two worlds, it's one single reality that can be seen and experienced and understood from multiple perspectives. And so I'm just introducing this, you could call it kind of a transcendental perspective, which is the recognition that reality doesn't in fact collapse in the ways we imagine it's collapsible into our definitions and descriptions. And that is liberating to, to, to feel the, the reality of that. <laughs>